virtual women in software engineering meetup. Um, this is the last one of 2020. Uh, for those of you that may be new to our events, Women in Tech is a third republic employee-led effort that challenges the gender imbalance that exists among software engineers and other technical roles. Our mission is to connect, inspire and develop the careers of female engineers in order to make technology a more diverse working environment. This evening we're joined by Anna and Rania, both incredibly experienced and tech professionals. Hi, this, uh, I will be talking about design patterns and how I see the future of software engineering. Um, I'm Anna and um, I work for Marley Spoon for around three months now and I've been living in Berlin for two years and a half, just a quick intro. Um, so uh, the, uh, I will have some sections for tonight. So I'll have like summary now. So basically what I will talk about is uh, what are design patterns, why uh, use it, some future related topics that I think that match the topic and how I think it can help shape the future of software engineering and patterns and, and future like when we're talking about patterns itself um, so what are design patterns so uh, i have a uh, like i have some references in the end of the presentation so where is uh, where is the place where i took those info from so i tried to be like very um i try to resume it a lot but i don't know if it's like too resume but design patterns are general and reusable solutions to solve some occurring problems in the in software design for example when you were uh, designing a um a software that you need to use and you need to you cannot like it's not good if you just start throwing code you have some um solutions that you that are already like very well structured and you can use it to pre-customize your um your code so it's in a way that is more readable more reusable flexible and everything that might help um your development along the way not only when you are starting it so they are not algorithms but they are more like general concepts on how to solve a problem. So they, you have a lot of problems that you might in, uh, encounter and they just help you to, um, to have concepts on how to implement that in an easier way. Uh, there are three main, uh, three main classifications for patterns that those are the ones I will talk about tonight. Uh, the creational is about uh, cre uh, like creation mechanisms to make um, objects more flexible and reusable, structural that explain how to bring together objects and make it more efficient and flexible so we can reuse them in the, when we need and, um, and everything just settles together in a better way. Uh, behavioral deals with uh, effective communication and assignment of responsibility. So it's more around um, where you settle the things uh, and see if everything makes sense and if it's reusable for the future. So why use it? Um, so design patterns are a, a set of tried and test solutions. So even if you don't need all of them, we will see 23 tonight very uh, quickly. But it's still nice to know them because it helps with your thinking. So how you think of software in general. So it helps you to understand better. Um, like if you, if you use it, it's better for other people to read it. So as it says in, in the second topic, like if your team have a good understanding on design patterns, it's easier to communicate efficiently. So. Uh, you don't need to be explaining everything that is happening. It's just like there and everyone can understand the idea behind the concept you are implementing. So I've brought some future related topics that I think that might relate to design patterns. Uh, the first one is continuous integration and continuous deployment. And the reason why I think that that's very important for the future is that um, software is growing a lot in the in the past years 
and we need to have ways to always be interacting with the software and always releasing new stuff and that's uh, and continuous integration and continuous deployment is a way to um, automate and assemble builds from developing to live or production easily in an in in a reliable way so uh, with that teams can release apps much faster and can be like um, always interacting with customers and, and public in general. Um, progressive web apps. So um, nowadays we have lots of different screens. We have phones, we have smart TVs, we have monitors and laptops. So we need to find a way, a reliable way to guarantee that our project will work um, in all kinds of, of possible views. So I think that design patterns relate the, uh, are related to that because that helps you to find like a way to make something more um, general, but in the way like flexible enough to relate to those um, trendings that we see in the future. And uh, last but not least, uh, it's Internet of Things. And by, like Internet of Things, for the ones that don't know, is like interacting with sensors and devices that help you, um, for example, um, like uh, like we have Roomba, for example, that cleans the house and it's an Internet of Things and communicates with you. And for me, uh, the vision I have is that, but. As you can if, uh, offer various advantages, we need to keep in mind that evolving software needs to be um, reusable and easily handed over when necessary. So we need to have uh, some patterns in mind to make it easier to make this technology move forward. Uh, how it can help shape the future on my view. So design patterns are, be, are beyond uh, programming language, which means that you are not dependent on any structure to apply those ideas. So you don't need to have like this specific language which works with this specific pattern. It's just more a general concept that helps you implement in any language. So it's really good to have in your mind when you are developing. Uh, as mentioned before, uh, one um, once the teams uh, have knowledge on, on those patterns, it facilitates com uh, conversation in the development process. Why did I add that here? Because now everyone is mostly working remotely, so we need to find ways to be more um, efficient when we are talking to someone to make everyone aligned in the team and make sure that everyone's understand what's going on and what will be implemented. So I think that that's a nice use for the future we have right now. Um, it also helps developers to build reliable and reusable prototypes uh, because those general concepts are tested, so it's easier to plan an architecture of a solution. And also by building flexible structures, we can speed up changes on development, which relates to CIC, uh, continuous deployment and continuous uh, integration. So I will quickly give an overview of the patterns that I've been, uh, been studying in the past months. So there are 23. So mostly all the time, not everyone uses it a lot, uh, like all of them, but if you get to a good knowledge of them, it's, it's already really good. So as I said, there are three main um, classifications. The first one is creational. The, it has like um, six uh, patterns inside of it, the abstract factory, factory which creates an instance of several classes, uh, family, families of classes. So then the builder, which separates object construction from its representation. The factory method that creates an instance of several derived classes. So for deriving classes in itself, it's a very used one. Object pool, which avoid uh, expensive acquisition and release of, of, of resources by recycling objects that are no longer used. So you are refactoring some parts that you already have, but you are not using that much. So prototype, a fully initialized instance to be copied or cloned. So you can uh, work with the prototype you already have. And singleton, which is very popular as well, uh, a class of which only a single instance can exist. So. You always have this one um, 
instance that exists over that, so you don't need to be reinstancing all the time. Um, so the second one is the structural classification, and it has eight um, patterns inside of it. So the adapter, which match interfaces of different classes, so you can pass through them uh, in the interface, the bridge, separately, which separates the uh, object's interface from its implementation, the composite, uh, it's a tree structure of simple composite objects, the facade, which is a single class that represents an entire subsystem, the flyweight, which is a fine grain instance, we'll use it for efficient sharing, and private, day, pri private class data, which restricts XR mutator um, access, and the proxy, which uh, an object representing another object. So the behavioral, there's a lot. <laughs> and I promise that I will be working on, uh, after that, we, we just get the, the entry for that. So the first one is chain of responsibility, which is a way of passing requests between chain of objects. The command, which encapsulate a command request as an object. The interpreter, which is the way to include language elements in a, pro in a program. So, yeah, I can, I can, I could like explain them, but I will, I will keep to the, to what I wrote. So the iterator is sequentially access the uh, elements in the, of a collection. The mediator defines simplified communication between classes. The uh, memento, which captures and ensure uh, an object's internal state. The null object, uh, which is designed to act like as a default value of an ob object. So, yeah. And the observer, a way of notifying change to a number of classes. So you have one main class that notify the others when it's necessary. Uh, the state uh, alter an object's behavior when its states change. And the strategy, which encapsulates an algorithm inside a class, the template method that defer the exact steps of an algorithm to a subclass, and the visitor that defines a new operation to a class without change. So that's basically what I wanted to bring up tonight to, so we can have like this quick overview and understand how it can affect the future of software development. And those are the, ref the references that I use, the Refactoring Guru and some top 10 software developer trends for 2020 and the Gengo 4 book, which is, oh, I thought it was about to open just a small, small page. But <clears throat> that's it. So, can you give us an example of a pattern that um, you have used in the past months? Yeah, so I've used the, for example, the bridge uh, in the past few months. And what I use that for is that we have like a main service that has a lot of like specific calls to an API. And we use it a main uh, class to have some uh, predefined um, methods that the children's class might use, for example, like, um, so they need to implement those in the, in the classes that will use the bridge. So that, that was one of the last uses that I had. We move on, I think there is one more question. Um, are design systems of value and importance to you from a UXR? Yeah, so I think it is important. Uh, are design systems of value and importance to you? Yes, because if you if you don't if you don't don't design your uh, system in a if you don't take the time to design what you are going to develop, then you don't have like a good structure for your app in the first place. And you need to have this structure to build like a good product that will go out and. Sometimes it could be something very delicate. So of course you need to have something, uh, some kind of like design, a system design, of, or you you gotta have a, like an architecture that you see fit uh, for the product that you're developing. So uh, yes, of course it's very of value and, and important for me. Thank you so much for your talk, Anna. Um, it was great, really informative. 
Um, I'm sure a lot of people, yeah, picked up a lot from that. So, um, moving on, uh, Renea is going to be talking about a digital native future and how software engineering is changing. Um, so I'll pass on to her. Digital native, because um, I see digital native is not only the present, the present and the future, and even it's um, reshaping a lot of our thinking from a software engineering perspective. Uh, let me start by a brief uh, about me, okay, um, I'm a solution architect, uh, um, cloud solution architect, uh, I'm uh, working for Google Cloud uh, and based in Amsterdam, Netherlands. Uh, I'm very, very, very fond uh, since ages about uh, cloud native and microservices and SOA and integration, okay. Um, the cloud itself, the aspect of connecting things and the connected cars and the, uh, and the autonomous driving, this is something that is really um, giving me passion, I mean, to work, okay. Uh, service meshing is one of the toppest favorite uh, thing that um, I have in my mind. I even usually try to uh, write out uh, blogs and even share information about service meshing because it's one of the, uh, the, the passion that I have today. I mean, not only in the cloud, but uh, uh, as well uh, um, in the hybrid story, how service meshing is really serving that. So um, I will not share agenda. I'm gonna just speak freely and um, uh, 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 provide my opinion from a digital native uh, on how really I'm seeing that it is really reshaping the software engineer. So what is digital native? Okay, By definition, digital native, those are the people who really um, uh, uh, were brought up uh, or grow up during the uh, technology era. Okay, So they are really more into computer, into mobile and into uh, devices, tablets and different uh, uh, smart devices. Okay, And I, I put that cartoon uh, because really it's expressing there that digital native is switching even the customer uh, objective and the customer demand. You see here, uh, this is a baby who is coming back from uh, kindergarten and he's not happy because he did not find accessibility, he did not find Wi-Fi. This is uh, some people would think that this is too much, but this is the normal nowadays. I mean, I cannot live, for example, without my mobile uh, for like uh, five minutes. OK, uh, without my computer, I cannot live uh, one day. Uh, this is this is true. I mean, again, this is the digital native aspect that is really reshaping the customer demand and the customer goal and hence reshaping everything, including the software engineering. So let's talk about what is the expectation and uh, the interest of a digital native, because in the end, whenever we are building the software, or whenever we are doing anything in the whole world, we are aiming for the customer uh, that is using it, okay? So uh, the, the digital native customer interest and expectation is to more be, have um, uh, different channels, different devices, uh, portability. They don't want to talk about uh, uh, limiting themselves for using only laptops or desktops or workstations. No, they want to be able to use any smart device, any portable device. They even um, are biased more to smart, to smart device uh, and portable devices. Also, uh, whenever they are learning things, they want to intuitively learn things. So they are learning things by sense, by um, and, and that's why even they are uh, multimedia oriented. They don't want to really hear the whole logic in order to deduce something or learn something from it. No, they want to really uh, feel it and sense it and see it, okay? And really fast, doing everything very fast everything. I mean, uh, if I'm shopping something, okay, and it's taking me like um, 10 hours to do the shopping online, this is not acceptable for me. Even if I'm uh, uh, requesting any service and the service response is not very fast, is not fast enough for me, I will just expel it. So digital native are always talking about speed, expecting very high speed from the services that they are consuming. Accessibility and connectivity is very important. They want to be able to do anything from anywhere, okay? And from anywhere across the whole globe, and sometimes even from anywhere, not only devices, and not only geographical regions, but as well uh, from different 
uh, applications and different uh, uh, way of doing things. Okay? And that's why social network and social media is important for them. I mean, something like Facebook, something like Instagram, integration with uh, LinkedIn, integration with different channels that they are used to use on a daily basis. They want to really hear the knowledge. They want to really be connected um, across the whole world. Okay. Uh, also, they understand the technology. So that's why they are a little bit sophisticated customer because uh, it's not easy to, um, I wouldn't say fascinate them, but satisfy them. Okay. And that's why they are increasing the expectation and the demand for uh, any service uh, consumption. Also, they are more into digital. I mean, whenever we are talking about, for example, uh, taking notes, drawing something, um, capturing thumbs, uh, something, even in, 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 for example, in navigation, they want to have uh, everything digitalized, not analog, not uh, uh, paperwork, not even integration in the old fashion or the old school way. No, they want to really always be wowed from the service that is uh, delivered to them. Um, a lot of people with, uh, in, in the software engineer would uh, mix uh, uh, digital native with uh, digital transformation. Okay, and this is not the case. I mean, digital native is a goal. Okay, whenever we are building something, service or business or uh, whatever, uh, uh, even a product or an application, and we want to say that I am digital native. Okay, uh, this is your goal that you want to achieve. Okay, this is uh, your target. Digital transformation is more the methodology to take legacy enterprises or legacy uh, uh, portfolio or legacy application to move it towards the scale of digital native. And whenever we have the topic of digital uh, transformation, um, it is a complex topic. Why is it a complex topic? Because we are not talking about uh, transforming one application or even uh, 10 people. Uh, from an, I mean, an enterprise or a company of uh, size 10 people. We are talking about big enterprises, big banks, uh, or uh, even big industries. How to really transform them to the digital native era smoothly without really, um, I wouldn't say without risks, but with identifying the risk of the transformation and mitigated plan platform. And that's why uh, the digital transformation is the ability to really, um, in a simple English, digitize your own business, digitize your own culture, how to make it more into digital native. Okay. Um, the target there, really, because again, digital native have very high expectation. The target, again, for the transformation is very high. Like, for example, one of the targets, how to really integrate two businesses. So smoothly, I mean, two different business contexts. As you can see in the, the, that uh, picture, we are integrating different contexts, like, for example, traffic with uh, banks, with uh, railways, with uh, airways, with uh, uh, social media. We are differently, I mean, we have different contexts, different industries, and they are capable of integrating together in order to have a learning system because the idea behind the digital native because in order again uh, in order to really meet and achieve the expectation of the digital native we need to build um, a learning system okay not only only a knowledge a generic knowledge management system but as well a learning system between different contexts like for example the weather can be communicating or consuming consumed by, for example, the transportation. Those are two different industries, two different uh, contexts even. Uh, their logic and methodologies and applications and languages and everything is different, but they are capable to communicate with each other and help in the educational uh, path or the learning path of the business there. Okay. Um, Again, it's as if, think of it as if we are building wide ecosystem, okay, from a business, from a different perspective uh, uh, and different context altogether. And again, because um, digital native is talking about speed, talking about accessibility, accessibility, uh, connectivity, we need to be innovative, we need to be reactive, not responsive. Because remember that it's not easy to satisfy the digital native consumer he has already uh, he or she has 
very high expectations. So it's not easy to wow them. It's not easy to satisfy them. And your aim should be wow them. And that's why you should regularly promote new features, new businesses, new things in order to keep uh, their interest okay, in the service that you are building. And let's talk about uh, um, how the software development and the software engineer uh, were focusing on. I mean, what are uh, the, the focus or the main point for the software development and the software engineer before digital? And what are the problems that we were targeting to 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 um, to achieve, to fix, or to uh, uh, have practices to really overcome those obstacles? Uh, the focus there was really I want to really focus on enriching my business services and features. I want to really plan for new features, like for example, in the cars. If we're talking about automotive, I want to plan for uh, new models and new design to the car itself, uh, uh, new uh, functionality for the motor to make it uh, more speed, more uh, stuff for safety and all that stuff. Again, those are mainly automotive business features or mainly automotive services. Also, we were focusing on, uh, 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 on the time to business market. And what's time to business market? I mean, let's say, for example, we are talking about Daimler. Daimler was focusing on the competitive, their competitors in the automotive industry. So they, their focus from a time to market was on the current business only, not on the whole world, not on everything. Okay. Um, environment governance as well. Another problem that we were facing in the software development and software engineer is that how to really control what is being released in, uh, uh, in a specific environment, whether it's testing or staging or production, how to make sure and guarantee that the, that the performance is not going to be impacted or the quality of the services that is uh, uh, delivered from a security, from a performance, from a functional and other non-functional aspects are uh, met okay we are not really breaking anything productivity was an uh, issue as well uh, because uh, again uh, one of the issues that we were facing uh, prior digital native is that we were planning and developing long releases like three month releases or like even six month releases okay and uh, whenever uh, we send the release for the business owner or for the client to test it okay I'm, I'm talking here about the client as the business client not the end consumer okay they were coming back no this is not the requirement no this is not uh, what we uh, meant uh, this is broken where are the business rules this is not how i expected it uh, my expectation right now is different and even sometimes they change their um, request and that's why managing the whole uh, productivity together with the uh, governance of the requirements was really, again, a focus to make sure that things are really in control. Uh, business quality, uh, again, uh, as I mentioned, B2B and B2C integration, it was an issue. Okay? And it is still an issue. I'm not saying that it is not a challenge, but it was a main and a big challenge how to really manage the integration between different, uh, between a partner and the service provider and between different vendors, how to make sure that we have really the proper integration set up between the different parties, par I mean. Also, we were focusing about the modern uh, programming language uh, and platforms. We were talking about Oracle database, uh, Microsoft SQL database, uh, uh, Java, uh, .NET, uh, uh, Golang, whatever. Okay, so we were focusing more on really building the whole system in a consistent way using one modern uh, programming language and one modern platform. Okay, whether it's a data platform or reporting platform or even um, um, a platform like uh, an application server or a runtime platform. Okay, and the uh, possible practices that we have uh, that uh, we invent and uh, really. Um, came up with in order to help in really delivering such focuses were DevOps for continuous integration, I mean, which includes continuous integration, continuous deployment, and even we implemented or defined their different levels of DevOps in order to really help in the governance, help in the productivity, help in the, the, the quality assurance and all the uh, stuff that is related to uh, controlling and governing the software uh, 
life cycle. Also, agile methodologies were uh, invented there because this is going to help in the productivity, making sure that the business is aligned with the developers and with the architects and different stakeholders, making sure that we deliver faster uh, to uh, the client in order to make sure that we verify that uh, um, whatever we are building is consistent uh, with uh, whatever the client is envisioning from a business and from a user interface perspective and from a business flow perspective. Also, infrastructure as a code was uh, uh, invented uh, and introduced in order to help in the automation and to make sure, uh, sure that the productivity is uh, uh, met because in that case, we are automating the provisioning of the environments, the provisioning of the services itself, uh, helping with the business quality in the business continuity and different flavors that we were facing by that time. I mean, it was a pain by that time, how to really manage the infrastructure, especially that by that time, cloud was not uh, adopted that much, I mean. Also, enterprise service bus and message broker and BPMN and business rules and all the nice flavor standards that we have in tools and platforms in order to tackle the business automation and to tackle as well the integration issues. It was as well invented and introduced to help with that uh, aspect. Test automation again to for the quality and for the um, uh, uh, regression testing and validating whenever we are adding more features while not breaking anything. All the aspects uh, that is related to the modern uh, software development like test driven uh, 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 test development driven test development driven uh, approach TDD and as well the pair programming and others. Okay. Let's talk about uh, what is what was the focus out of that, uh, what I shared here, for the software development and the software uh, um, engineering, I mean. The focus there that we were trying to satisfy the business. So the main aspect was there, I wanna make sure that I meet uh, uh, the, the, the objectives of the business owner, whoever is defining the requirements, okay? This was the aim, that I wanna really meet the industry uh, satisfy the industry, satisfy the business owner and make sure that I don't uh, uh, implement uh, um, incorrect requirements or miss a requirement that is defined by the business owner. And also another thing that uh, were highlighted uh, or uh, used uh, in that era is that data were treated as history. I mean, we were treating data as data at arrest, okay, or data for reporting. Nothing more. I mean, data was not really uh, used as uh, um, a treasure. We were not treasuring data by that time because it was a matter of just keeping it as a history, okay, for reference, for auditing, for reporting, for compliance. That's all, okay. But we were not really focusing uh, on anything beyond that. And even we were talking about securing the data at the rest and securing the data in the communication, but not really driving anything from this data because we were not treasuring the data by that time. Uh, after digital native, because again, um, the digital native customer increased the, 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 the target and the, the goal and the expectations, okay? and hence the focus from a software engineer and the software development is changed. And even by the way, uh, just to give you an example, uh, telecos, for example, before digital native, teleco were focusing on what one just their uh, uh, um, services that um, they were uh, um, delivering like 2G or even 3G and 4G, okay? Right now, telecos are focusing more on the edge computing because the edge computing is more into the cloud. Right? They are, yes, delivering the services, the telecom services, but as well they are integrating with other business industries in order to deliver the aspect of the digital native uh, uh, experience for the customers. The focus here more was on the customer experience and the customer journey. So we care more about the client. We care more about the end client, not the business uh, client, no the end customer, the end consumer. So for example, for the automate, automotive, we ca care more about the digital native person who is driving the car, who is using the car, who is uh, sitting inside the car, okay? What is his journey and experience in the car or in the automotive in general? 
Um, again, uh, the focus was because, again, remember that uh, the digital native were talking about fast, digital, more into technology, connected, um, uh, connectivity, accessibility, um, fast. You need to wow the digital native consumer. It's not easy to satisfy him or her. And that's why the focus, one of the focuses, build smart services. You need to be intelligent. You don't need to only deliver the business because if automotive companies, or if any of the automotive companies only focus on the, um, investing in the car itself without adding services like the connected car services, like the smart and intelligent services that we have inside the car, those are not part of the automate, automotive uh, industry. Those are more part uh, of, uh, uh, of the smart services and the intelligent services that we are delivering through the car in order to enhance the customer journey and experience and customer life while he is sitting or driving the car. Also, we need to uh, um, the focus. We need to be proactive rather than responsive. We need not to wait uh, for a problem or wait until the customer requests something like uh, wait for a customer to really think or search about a product to share to uh, to buy. It. No, we need to be proactive and recommend a product to the customer uh, or even um, advice from a healthcare perspective, advice some, st some stuff based on some smart services and others as well. Uh, no service disruption because before we were talking about SLA 99.999 or even 99.95, okay, right now the customer, uh, the digital native customer is not expecting any delays, is not expecting any disruption. Uh, he's always, he or she is always expecting the service to, whenever they need it, they will get it. Just like the Netflix or the Facebook, nobody can really accept those services to go down. Uh, again, industry integration is very important. I mean, I want to integrate, uh, not using only single sign, but integrating the data. And I would just give you an example uh, at the end of the, 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 the presentation. Also, channels are important. Whenever you are building a software or a product, channels definitely is important. Like, for example, the automotive uh, industry. Yes, they need to build something in the car uh, as a smart uh, service, but they need to connect the smart service to my mobile, to my iWatch, to uh, my laptop, to my home devices, okay? So that I am feeling that I can do whatever I want from anywhere, okay? Uh, time to market. Before we were talking about time to business market. No, right now we are talking about time to work to market. I'm seeing what's happening in the whole world, not only in my current industry or my current business. No, because let me um, just uh, tell you something. Like for example, the VR, okay, the virtual reality. Uh, let's say that uh, whoever invented the virtual reality, if the automotive car or the automotive sorry industry. Uh, if it does not consider the virtual reality at a certain point, they will lose. I mean, the customers will lose interest in the uh, industry itself. The industry itself will not progress as before, as expected. And hence, the innovation in the automotive itself will stop. Okay, that's why right now, even the industries and the businesses are not just focusing on the, their current industry, but as well investing in um, understanding what ha what is happening in the other industries, what is happening in the social media, what is happening in the uh, airway, what, ha what is happening in other industries as well, to make sure that whoever uh, 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 is using other industries is really satisfied by this industry. Business service and business feature is still a focus, by the way, and, and, and governance is still a focus, but it's not the main focus any, uh, anymore. And also learning, okay, because again, how the, the ultimate goal in the digital native, how to make my life easy, how to deliver me the most complex uh, service, okay, in an easy and simple way and digital way and fast way. And that's why Right now, the product itself needs to learn from the history, from its history, and needs to learn from others, other industries, okay? 
like for example uh, what uh, what are the um, uh, uh, the expectations of the youth uh, uh, between for example uh, 16 years and 18 years in a specific geographical region because this will help in improving the customer experience and the customer journey and hence moving forward with the industry and doing innovations and invention in such industry. What are the different uh, practices that um, evolved out of those focuses? Definitely AI and ML. AI and ML adoption was uh, a priority there because this is going to help you in the learning methodology, in the education and the learning curve, as well as in uh, building smart service and as well enhancing the customer experience and customer journey. Because right now you are really building smart products. You're not just building products by if, else or switch cases or business logic. No, you are more focusing on really being more intelligent, more smart, more predictive, more wise in order to really satisfy and also wow your customer. Uh, cloud native and microservices is, a, uh, is a, uh, another pattern that uh, got introduced because of the scalability and because of uh, how to really maintain the, 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 the valuable load and make sure that we don't have any disruption in the service, make sure that it is fast, make sure that we are capable, no matter what's happening, to be uh, uh, more proactive and handle more load. API Gateway and API Management was another uh, uh, thing that got introduced in order to integrate different businesses, in order to integrate different vendors and to really overcome the integration issue. And even event-driven architecture was supporting really how to really um, integrate smoothly without really uh, facing the, the old school integration problem in its complexity, like building an API and hosting this API and doing a mediation and all that stuff and dependency if the service is down or the service provider is down, the consumer is uh, impacted and that stuff. Innovation is a big uh, practice that uh, got introduced because again, um, digital native is always expecting um, whoever is building the product or the service to not only think out of the box, but innovate, invent something new every day. I mean, he's expecting, he or she is expecting whenever they are using the service of the product to really see something new, okay? And not something new that is uh, gonna make uh, his life pain. No, something new that uh, really can think of it. Wow, this is smart. Wow, this is fascinating. Wow, this is really helpful. Uh, uh, I learned a lot from it, okay? Business automation is an important thing because remember, uh, fast, we need to deliver everything. Fast, we need not to break anything. We need not to deliver less business quality. We need to not only maintain the business quality, but increase it in a fast manner, but as well deliver things in um, an intelligent way. IoT and edge computing is a must there because we want to connect everything with everything and really deliver, um, collect the data from anywhere and really do the computation that we want to do. and. Uh, have no latency and that's why edge computing is a, is a very important uh, pattern and uh, practice that is uh, used highly definitely in the teleco okay and in other industries like automotive and airways and others big data as well as serverless serverless is an important thing because again um, remember that um, one of the main uh, concerns of the software development and software engineer before digital native and after digital native is the cost, the uh, cost of the operational, the cost of the software, the cost of the uh, platform, the cost of uh, a lot of the stuff. And that's why serverless and cloud adoption are important. Cloud is really helping a lot with the digital native because not only it is a, a public and helping with the public aspect, but as well helping with the uh, channels, channels providing different channels, um, global accessibility, connectivity, and even as well, the cloud providers uh, uh, are always innovating on a in a technology perspective so that you can consume those innovations in your software uh, product. Uh, what we conclude from that is that 
again, uh, before we were talking about uh, business owner, industry, now we are talking about customer experience. This is the main driven thing. I mean, we can really change the business and the industry roadmap based on the customer experience. I mean, if the customer is uh, expecting something, if the customer is uh, not satisfied with the industry, if the, uh, if the customer is aiming to have a feature from another industry to this industry, or even from a smart perspective, I mean, intelligent services and smart services perspective, this can change the whole roadmap and the whole strategy of the product and the industry. Right now, data is more treasured because data is uh, really the fuel of everything. I mean, without data, you don't have anything. Because data, not only it's a history, it's a history, but you are able to derive from it, from it information, useful information. You are able to build your own knowledge within industry, within uh, different, uh, different categories and different insights, I mean, different um, classifications of your data and also you are able to really define your wisdom path what is the future shall i predict something shall i uh, um, advise my consumer for something shall i um, uh, uh, avoid something because again data can help not only in um, enhancing the customer experience from a usability perspective but it can really help uh, with the um, optimizing and enhancing the life of the person itself i mean this is this is something that can be very powerful I, for example could predict that uh, i can for example have a, a heart attack in one hour or something i can for example predict uh, something good or something bad again it's based on the calculations of the data that i have that i'm capturing from everywhere Again, um, data here is not talking about history, it's not talking about storage, it's not talking about uh, reports and not talking about um, even audits and compliance, but more we are talking about events, having the capability to really deal with a, um, a change in the data and uh, drive from it a change in the information, change in my knowledge that will really impact understanding my wisdom. What is the wisdom? How can I define uh, my own wisdom path. Let me give you an example about uh, digital native, and this is again for uh, retail, for a supermarket, okay? So, for example, we are using here um, uh, augmented reality together with machine learning and AI, okay? And through the tablet or through the mobile, um, the, the, the product itself or the software itself is able to really assist the customer in the shopping and really help uh, not only identifying the products but as well um, uh, providing some sort of recommendations to the product to the customer and this is gonna help the customer to um, have a better experience shopping experience in the supermarket itself and even that is used uh, um, uh, in online they are some of the supermarkets are using it in the online shopping uh, after COVID-19 so this is really an example for digital makeup because I expect that I should have uh, a connected I mean I should be able to view the supermarket select whatever I want and even uh, capture uh, a different uh, uh, comparison between different products online on the fly I don't need to go and really compare it on the uh, Google or compare it uh, elsewhere or even ask my friend no I want to really have it in front of my eye in no time and uh, digitalized, okay? Um, this is a sample to the architecture. I mean, again, you can, it's just a sample to show you how can we implement it, okay? How can we implement digital natives, okay? Usually, whenever you are implementing digital native, you are not relying on um, one cloud, okay? You are relying on um, different clouds and even sometimes uh, ground, application running uh, applications or data resides in uh, data centers, okay, and as well edge computing, okay. Uh, whenever you are talking about uh, um, workloads, we are not any more focusing on programming language and remember the focus point for the digital native. I don't care whether you use Java or Go or .NET or Python or whatever. This is not the problem anymore. And I don't care which cloud or which infrastructure 
you are gonna use because this is not important anymore. The most important thing is to really the customer to deliver a better and an enhanced customer journey and experience. And that's why I don't care if you are doing work uh, containerized workloads or non-containerized workloads. If it is a Java or if it is a .NET, if it is uh, MySQL or if it is Postgres or if it is uh, whatever kind of database. Okay. In the end, uh, the, the idea behind it is that I'm able to connect all that together to deliver a good and a smart customer experience. Uh, you can see here we have different flavors that is delivered by the cloud and delivered by the, the application development communities, communities like PaaS, FAST, Kubernetes, containers, all the, uh, the, the, the modern uh, techniques and uh, um, uh, strategies that is supporting the digital native aspects. Okay. Uh, auto provisioning, AI anywhere. This is the idea. I want to really be able to capture data from anywhere and deliver my services anywhere. And that's why the hybrid story or the digital native story as well is supporting AI anywhere. So you are able to run AI on the edge computing or run it on this cloud or this cloud or even on-prem or even in the factory if you are enhancing the customer journey for the factory and for, for, for example, for some, for goods like um, food goods or any goods that you are manufacturing. API gateway and business automation as well as used there as you can see, uh, can see as well as DevOps, uh, as well as the uh, uh, service broker, and service catalog and microservices and, my, and, and cloud native, whether it's stateless or stateful. So with that, I'd like to thank you all and I'm open for questions. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nia. That was so interesting, and it's so thank you for all of that. And um, we do have a few questions, so I'll just run um, run them through with you. Um, so the first question was um, around like environment government governance, um, and uh, it was does environment governance improve if uh, like sprints are run, reviewed, and stakeholders get to see the process at regular points? Uh, again, environment, government, uh, definitely, definitely, if you have sprint and agile, uh, the governance there is, um, is something that is really um, improving and enhancing. Because whenever you are testing um, agile, you are implementing a feedback approach. So you are always learning from whatever you are doing so that in the future you are avoiding things okay but again um, it's not mainly on the uh, agile, uh, agile or the sprint planning and that stuff the governments of the, um, the environment is more into the devops capabilities okay whenever we are building workflows to control the promotion and to um, also build continuous integration and also build continuous deployment where which feature should go for what which feature should be delivered to whom? Which feature, the, what kind of criteria that I need to pass before moving to uh, a specific environment? It could be security testing, uh, pen testing, um, stress testing, whatever. I mean, I could pass and go to staging, for example, if I pass the functional testing, but non-functional, no, I cannot go to production, for example. Um, oh, next question. question. Um, yeah, so the next question was around the practices um, when you was running through obviously like DevOps and Agile and basically asking um, if you think that they're all equally as important um, when it comes to like an organisation um, and their digital transformation or if you think there are some that play more of a vital, like, vital part in that, so for example like DevOps. Uh, definitely digital transformation um, have some, uh, I mean, we cannot go for smart services if we don't have concrete DevOps, okay? We cannot go for uh, building smart and intelligent things if we don't, uh, if we are still living by old culture, okay? Because again, in the end, if we are going to aim for digital native, okay, and do digital transformation, we need to educate the the culture and the people. The people are the assets who are really doing the test cases, the coding, the, the business. So if they are not really into the digital native world, okay, you, I mean, things will fail. The digital transformation will fail. So there are definitely different practices that are important, like cloud adoption is an important, 
DevOps is an important, okay? I would say as well, uh, event-driven architecture is an important because this is um, the aspect of really how to build those decoupling services. So really the architecture is important uh, with respect to event-driven architecture, with, the, with respect to the API gateway and API management. But the most important thing is to start by DevOps because if you don't educate people from a training perspective, from a culture perspective, the digital transformation will fade, definitely. Yeah. Next question. Um, so what measures would you take to ensure the data captured is of good quality and reliable and can be used for predictive um, analysis or reporting? OK, that's a very good question because, um, again, we have different um, best practices for assessing the coverage of the data whenever we are running machine learning. OK, we have training data and really making sure that uh, whatever we are using is of good quality, of high coverage, and it's fair because AI can really be unfair. I mean, you can have a model that is trained based to a specific gender, for example, or based to a specific color. Okay, so we need to treat that uh, uh, as an important thing in our methodology, because again, the aim is to enhance everybody' uh, experience, not specific category of the customer's experience, and that's why uh, there are different one. Uh, there are well-defined sorry processes and life cycle for the data in order to validate that you have high coverage, to validate that uh, even the data is. Um, consistent, you don't have right conflicts, okay? And also to test your own data prior building your uh, trained uh, model and moving it to production, okay? And we had a question as well, um, just asking around like any book or source that you'd recommend to learn more around the topic of, I'd assume of obviously like a digital native future and always uh, recommend to um, read in the, um, the aspect of the cloud native okay because cloud native is the start of things okay uh, also AI we have a, a huge uh, different uh, categories for AI and for machine learning digital native itself uh, we are still building I mean we don't have quite resources that is really defining everything okay uh, but there are some resources that are really good Okay, for, uh, uh, especially for the practices of the digital transformation. I could send a set of papers that are really nice to just explain from a brief perspective why we are doing digital native and why, uh, what is the current obstacles, because this is an important thing as well. Uh, again, the road is not clear <laughs> and the road is not clean as well. <laughs> we have a lot of obstacles and a lot of uh, things to take care of. So um, just around some of the key considerations where uh, an organize, organization should make when starting their cloud adaption journey, um, like what are the mistakes to avoid or challenges that people overlook when starting? Uh, this is again a very good question. Uh, usually organization and enterprises uh, um, don't consider the culture. Okay, Again, culture is a fatal, fatal thing. I mean, it's not a matter of um, just talking about technology and process, because uh, again, whenever we are talking about cloud adoption, it's technology process or architecture and uh, process and as well uh, the culture, because you cannot do um, anything without the people, without your assets. OK, so you need to get their buy in. You need to train them. Well, you need to uh, let them understand what is the um, aim of it. Why are we moving forward towards that? And what if we don't move towards the digital native? Why are we going to the cloud? A lot of people would just oppose managed services or serverless because this means that I don't have a job. No, you need to really maybe talk to your people, okay, and reskill them openly. But uh, uh, this is a, a lot of the enterprises would fail in the digital transformation because of that. They are not considering the people. They are not considering the aspect of training the people and reskilling people whenever needed and still focusing on only the aspect of the technology. OK, only the aspect of I want to modernize it. I want to move to the cloud. Yes, but whoever will migrate to the cloud and modernize your uh, portfolio and build your services in the end would be the people that you are using for development, for testing, for business. So you need to get their buy-in. And this is a very important 
thing in the organization itself. With regards to PWA uh, progressive web apps, um, it's still in uh, some ways behind native apps. How does this affect this topic? So. Again, uh, we're not saying that uh, the whole set of uh, the software engineering is the, into the digital native and not or even the enterprises. I mean, even when we are talking about um, big enterprises and industries, they still have mainframe. Okay? And really, mainframe is not into the topic of the digital native, uh, even. Um, that's why uh, whenever we are talking more into developing a journey for the digital transformation, think more about hybrid. Think more about moving smaller steps, proven steps, glue it to whatever you have today until you are completely re-innovating your portfolio. Okay. And you can live by some of the applications that they are not moving towards the cloud. Some of the applications, they don't need to go uh, towards digital native. But again, don't uh, uh, aim to take it all as a one-step journey. No, it's not like that. It's a transformational journey. It's um, proven. It's better to go proven small steps. Okay. Um, again, I know that we have a lot of stuff, especially in the web apps and in the mobile apps that is not really meeting today the satisfaction of the customer okay but it is progressing we have uh, different um, new approaches and new strategies that is being offered by the cloud uh, uh, providers in order to support that area but again if you have an application don't really lift and shift it okay because it can uh, work temporarily but and on the long run, it can be a failure for the whole transformation journey. Um, I mean, thank you again, both Anna and Renéo, both being so um, helpful. And it's just really interesting to always learn more um, around, around these topics.